Okay, so coagulation is obviously how we stop our leaks. It's how we maintain homeostasis and keep our blood where it's supposed to be. Um, it's very important, that goes without saying, but it's also very important that when we don't want it or when we are done with it, it stops or doesn't happen where it shouldn't. Uh, obviously, we get just as many people dying from things like strokes or heart attacks caused by inappropriate clots uh, as we do from, you know, getting shot in the chest and bleeding out. So either way, it has to be very well controlled. And as we get into this and we start to see how complex it is, that's something to bear in mind because a big reason for the complexity is because the clotting process is full of these internal controls. It's got the, you know positive feedback loops to help magnify itself and really just explode the process when it needs to happen quickly. And it's got negative feedback loops to help manage and mitigate it and turn it back down when the process is done or when there's no clotting needs to happen. So you have your vasculature, your arteries and your veins, and we know about these, you know, it's full of different stuff, red blood cells, white blood cells, various gases, the plasma itself, the fluid, and amongst the rest of this is the clotting stuff. And the main backbone of this process is platelets. And platelets, compared to everything else, are really small. They're these little cells. They're made in the bone marrow. Um, they last a relatively short amount of time, about a week before they turn over. And you got a big store of them in your spleen in case you need a, a reserve of platelets. And that's worth thinking about because remember, most of these things, you talk about red blood cells, you know, they go to the lungs, they get loaded with oxygen, they dump the oxygen off in the tissues, and they circulate back and they get used again. Platelets actually get used up. When you use a platelet and it joins a clot, it goes away. So unlike most of these blood products, platelets actually have the ability to uh, to get used up and you have a limited number. So something to think about. Another thing to think about is the fact that everything we need for clotting is actually present in the blood here. You got your platelets, you got what are called clotting factors, which we're gonna talk about, but they're really all here in the blood and in the walls of the vessels. So it's worth thinking, why is clotting not happening all the time? I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm not injured, but why is clotting not happening in my veins? And the main reason is because even though we have everything here, most of it is circulating in an active form. So yeah, we got platelets, but they're not activated. We got clotting factors, but they're dormant. They have to be activated first. And that's how this process works. We, we activate things, they activate other things, and then it kind of kicks off the whole process. But ordinarily, it's just lying there. Um, and finally, uh, a big reason why we don't have clotting just happening is because the blood's not just sitting there. It's actually moving very quickly. You have kind of this throughput. And it makes it difficult for things to collect. And really, clotting starts with collecting platelets. So as long as you have motion, that's hard to do. But if you get an injury, that becomes a lot easier. So now the other secret here is that if you remember your anatomy, the actual walls of the blood vessels are not um, single ply like cheap toilet paper. There's two main layers in here. You got the inner layer called the endothelium and then you got a layer behind that called the subendothelium. And what's fancy is the endothelium it's not only it has nothing that will activate the, the clotting process, it actually prevents it from being activated. The, the membrane wall secretes things like anticoagulants. But if we breach it and we open up the subendothelial tissue. This is full of some other stuff. So, if we have a wound, platelets are passing by, some of them will start to collect here. And it's not through any fancy mechanism, they're just floating around, and some of them will hit at the subendothelial surface. 
But when they do, they get activated by contact with the various things here. You got um, collagen and von Willebrand receptors and some other things. But the point is, they land here, they touch and they get activated, and when they do, you get different things happening. One is that they release some different chemicals, which do things like uh, vasoconstrict the area, cause some uh, constriction and clamping down of the, the wound edges. Uh, they help activate other platelets, so that's one of those it's one of those ways that the process helps feed itself and really magnify quickly. Uh, and they actually change shape. A regular platelet is kind of this little spherical thing, but when they get activated, they grow these little nubs on themselves. And eventually you end up with this sort of star-shaped thing with these arms on it. And basically what it's doing is making itself into a shape which is easier to stick together. So platelets in the area get activated, they activate other platelets, and so you end up with this collection of them. And eventually, you get a huge mass of activated platelets, and they form not a clot, but what's called a platelet plug. If these are kind of the bricks of the process, right now we just have a big pile of bricks. And it can actually slow or even stop the bleeding, but, I mean, it has no stability. A stiff breeze would blow it over. So, the whole next phase of this process is the actual coagulation process. It's when we turn the platelets into a clot. And this is a very long sequence of events. It's traditionally known as a coagulation cascade. And we don't need to know every detail about it. We don't even need to know most of the details, but I'm gonna give you the basic framework just so you get what's going on. Here in all its glory is a, a stripped down version of it. Don't get blown away here. Um, I'm gonna give a link to a, a, a full version of this in the, the post that goes along with this, but just to get a basic sense, you got two main pathways it's called the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. And these are also called the uh, uh, contact activation and the tissue factor pathway. Um, but they're both activated at with injury to the vessel. And then they follow different paths and then they meet up at what's called a common pathway. And from there on, they're just doing the same thing. So basically the way this works is you have tissue factors, which are just little little kind of enzymes. They're, they're present in the bloodstream, or uh, also secreted by the um, by the vessel. But they're active. They're present in inactive forms, and they're numbered usually, and they're traditionally written as Roman numerals. So, for instance, factor 12 is written as XII. But when they get activated, we write it as XIIA they tend to activate the next factor in the process. So you get this, this cascade where one factor becomes activated, it activates the next, it activates the next, and then you eventually end up where you need to be. Now, this whole mess is just serving to reach our endpoint, which is fibrin. And what fibrin is going to do is it's going to take these platelets and help marry them together. Fibrin is when it's activated, it's kind of these loose strands, like noodles. And when they get tangled up in the platelets, they bind it into a, a stiff, hard clot, which is going to have you know structural stability, and it'll maintain itself until the wound is closed. So that is the entire purpose of this process. But, I mean, very briefly, intrinsic and extrinsic pathways start with the injury. Uh, in the intrinsic, you get yeah, 12 turns into 12A, which turns 11 into 11A, which turns 9 into 9A. The extrinsic is much shorter. We just have 7 turning into 7A. But then at this point, both of them turn 10 into 10A. And this is the where the common pathway starts. And here things get a little bit more important. The big job of 10A is to turn prothrombin into thrombin. And thrombin is the the one ring of this process. It has a bunch of different effects. It, uh, it catalyzes a bunch of these activations, so it helps feed the loop itself. It helps activate more platelets. 
But the big, big thing it does is it turns fibrinogen, the inactive form, into fibrin, the active form. And again, that is our goal. There's actually one last step. Uh, 13A uh, helps cross-link the fibrin to really make it um, stable and cohesive, but fibrin is really what we're going for here. So do you need to know all these little bits and pieces? No, you don't. But as we talk about the drugs, we'll see how they come into this. So we're going to get into that later. But uh, just to add a few more pieces here. Um, like I said, there's a lot of little internal controls here. So what I haven't drawn in is how a lot of these activations help feed other ones. They will uh, help reinforce you know, previous factors. And also how some of them help inhibit other factors. And there are a lot of side loops here which are doing the same thing. A couple that are real important is there is an antagonistic factor floating around called antithrombin. And antithrombin's job is basically to inhibit thrombin. It also inhibits a couple other factors, but that's its, its big job. It uh, basically prevents thrombin from being activated. Another one we have uh, is called TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator. TPA's job is, I sort of half sketched it in here, TPA activates plasmin from plasminogen, hence tissue plasminogen activator, and plasmin just goes around and breaks down fibrin. So this is the thrombolytic process, or the fibrinolytics. When you already have your clot and we want to start breaking it down, and especially when we have inappropriate clots, like in a stroke, uh, plasmin goes and it just starts snipping those fibrin bonds. So you got your platelets, you got the fibrin tying them together. Plasmin comes in and breaks down the fibrin. And then you still got kind of wreckage from that, but the immune system just comes and cleans that up. So plasmin is a big way that we manage our fibrin. A um, couple other things. A lot of these factors, I didn't really draw it, but, uh, you know, uh, thrombin, uh, 10A, uh, 7A, in order to become activated, and in many cases to produce the inactive forms, um, usually in the liver, we need a, a couple other things. Most of them need calcium in order to be activated, and a lot of them also need vitamin K. And you know calcium, it's a mineral. Vitamin K is a vitamin. It sounds strange, but it's you get it dietarily, and it's uh, synthesized in your gut. You can have too little, you can have too much. But uh, we're going to talk about that a lot more because it's important to how some of the drugs work. Um, okay, so the next step is to figure out where those come in. So let's get to that.